Cool, everyone see that all right? Let me share some thumbs up just yet. Yeah, excellent, right, cool. So for those of you who are here last week, we talked about sort of the theory of Blazor and like how it works and sort of architectural concepts and things like that. Uh, this talk is uh, the polar opposite of that. We're gonna basically look at like two slides in PowerPoint and then gonna spend like 55 minutes watching me sweat writing code live, which is always interesting. So um, let me just whip through this. Um, for anybody who wasn't here, my name's Chris. I'm an MVP. I do a lot of work with Blazor. I do a lot of blogging. Um, that's boring. Let's get past that and let's talk what we get. Uh, I'll cover what we're going to talk about tonight. So there's kind of four main things that this talk covers, and that's uh, I'll talk slightly uh, about organizing applications and how you can do that, and some tips I've, I've found. Um, then we'll move into forms and validation. Um, we'll talk about JavaScript interop, and then uh, we'll finish off with authentication and authorization. Um, and then once we're done with all that, then I'll just hang around for however long people want to fire questions at me. Um, so I wasn't joking, that's it. Um, that's all the slides I've got for you. So um, let's go into Visual Studio. So do, 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 do. before I go over any of this, I will quickly show you the app actually. So this is the app we're gonna work with, um, Blazed Repairs. Um, I used to run a team where I worked to build repair software. So that's where this comes from. Um, the, uh, app really hasn't got a lot to it so we've got nothing on the dashboard we've got nothing on this new repairs page and this view repair page um, is just kind of there to list out some data so we can check some stuff but it, it, that's about it so um, that's the app we're going to be working with and building on and, and whatever to, this evening so let's go back into Visual Studio so this is uh, a Blazor WebAssembly application this is uh, in fact the Blazor, uh, Blazor WebAssembly ASP.NET Core hosted template so this means that you get three uh, projects in the solution by default. We get the client project, which is a Blazor WebAssembly app. We get the server project, which is an ASP.NET Core app. And then we have a shared library, which is a .NET standard class library. Um, how this works is that the server project is configured uh, with a cool little bit of middleware. And if I scroll down here, uh, it's got this bit there saying use Blazor, Blazor framework files. Um, and then it uses endpoint routing um, and it has this Mac fallback to file index.html. So this is actually configured to serve the, the WebAssembly application. So you kind of get them all in one go, which is quite cool. But we're not going to worry too much about the server project. I will reference it a few times, but it's more there so that we have a back end to work with. Um, we have some shared models in our uh, .NET class library because that is a great benefit if you use uh, C sharp code on the front end of the back end you can just stick shared code in a .NET standard class library and you can reference it from client and server and you don't have to duplicate your your models and DTOs anymore so that's where they sit and we'll come back to a few of those as we go and then we have uh, the actual Blazor WebAssembly app so let me just zoom in a bit over here so this is set up slightly differently from the traditional template that you get when you do a file new project with Blazor. Um, that's great to get going with, but personally I found um, building front, a lot of front end apps that dividing things by type doesn't tend to work particularly well. Um, mainly because once you get a lot of things in type folders, it makes them quite hard to navigate. Um, I worked on an app once that had like 300 controllers in an MVC app. So there was like 300 controllers in the controller folder and then 300 models in the model folder and 300 views in the views folder. Um, so navigating that became quite cumbersome. Um, so I really prefer feature folders, which is quite a common thing in other SPA application frameworks as well. Um, so this particular app has been configured that way. So in the feature folder, uh, features folder, we have all the features that make up this particular app. Um, I'm also quite a big fan of, of SAS. So uh, we have a styles folder here, which has a load of uh, SAS files in it. Um, and the great thing about feature folders, is you can actually keep your SAS files um, with your feature stuff. So if I come into this card component, for example, um, I've got the actual component itself and I've got its style file all in one place. So if I wanna make any changes to this card component, I haven't got to sort of come in here to find the component and then go delving in a different folder somewhere else to find the styles to alter that's all there in one place um, and this works for every other type of file so if you've got some classes that you know go with a particular component you can put that there 
whatever it happens to be, if it's related to that feature, put them all in that folder. It makes them all really easy to work with um, and re re really easy to find. So that's, I'll be honest, that's one of my biggest tips really. The only other thing I would say about as well, and this is a convention that me and my team at work kind of started to follow, was the idea of adding page to the end of any page component. So we talked about page components last week. So page components are any Blazor component that has a page directive inside it. Uh, that's what makes it into a page in a Blazor app. Now the problem is, the only way you can tell that is to actually open up the component itself and see if it has a page directive in it, which can be a bit naff. If you've got uh, a you know, decent sized app that has um, sort of uh, various components in a feature folder, you can't really scan and work out which one's the page. Um, so we started putting page on the end of them, uh, just as a, way, a quick way of being able to, to spot that that's the page and these are just sub components within that page. So, um, so yeah, so that's another little tip that we, we had as well. Um, but other than that, um, I'm not really gonna tell you much more because that's really the two big impacts we found, uh, the two big thing, or two things that had the biggest impact for us uh, was moving to feature folders um, and, and that naming convention. Other than that, it's, it's really up to you however you, however you wanna organize your apps. Um, the main reason I like to point this out in this talk really is to just highlight as well that there is no convention based stuff going on in Blazor. So, uh, because the default template has a pages folder and page components sit in it, um, I found some people think that that's a convention, um, but it's not, it's all about whether you have a page directive or not. So, um, so like I said, I like to show this just to, as an example, that you don't have to follow that template blindly. So. That's about it for that bit. So let's actually get going uh, with some of this stuff. So we're gonna start off by talking about forms and validation. So um, in order to uh, work through this, we're gonna add a, a form to our new repair page so that we can log a new repair in our app. So at the moment, it's just got this to do, which uh, isn't very useful. So we'll, uh, we're gonna go and paste in a chunk of code here because otherwise it's really boring watching me type. So, what I'm doing here, I've got a few different things going on, but for the moment, I'm gonna just highlight this chunk in the middle. So what I've done here is I've just pasted in a normal HTML form. There's nothing special about this. It's uh, a normal HTML form. It's got an action uh, and it's got a post method. So it's gonna try and post back to this API repairs endpoint. Um, now, this actually would work uh, in theory. Um, I haven't actually run this for a bit, so let me just come over here and spin this up. And let's have a look what happens if we try and run this one. So I'm using the hosted uh, WebAssembly template here. So it actually does um, auto rebuilding by refreshing the browser. I just have to make some changes to my Razor components and hit save. Um, it's usually a bit quicker than that, but it's probably because I'm doing Zoom and everything else. Um, so we can see that we've actually got a, a form here. So if I try and fill out some details um, and let's see what happens. So something like that and hit save. Ugh, not ideal. So we've got a few problems here. Firstly, um, we're doing a full page post back, which is kind of bad in a SPAR application. The whole point of a SPAR is that we don't want full page post backs. Um, we're also submitting JSON and obviously our endpoint, uh, uh, the form is not expecting things to be in JSON format and what have you. So this is not very good. So how can we actually work with a normal form in Blazor? Well, we actually don't have to do a huge amount to work with this. Um, what I'm gonna do is first of all, I'm gonna, create a model okay so i'm going to create a new instance uh, of this repair model to work with now this is kept in our shared project and this has just got all of the various uh, bits of information we want to record on our form so name issue trade contact number so that's sitting in that shared project so i'm just going to create an instance of it here on the component as a as a private field um, so that we can reference it and then what i can do is um, i can update these components and I can bind them to it. So what I'm doing here is I'm using Blazor's bind directive. Now this is how we do two-way two -way binding in Blazor. 
So I'm saying uh, for an input, I want to bind uh, the value property of that input to the name property on my repair model down here, okay? So that's all it's doing. I'm, I'm obviously repeating that for each of the controls as we go down. Now bind's quite cool. Um, when you use it on any of these input um, controls or, or the normal HTML form controls, it's intelligent enough to know what the specific property is or attribute it should bind to for that particular type of control. So if you have a control that doesn't have a value attribute, for example, it has something else like checkbox, for example, has a checked attribute, it will bind to that instead. So it, it will work that out for you, which is quite cool. So we've got that. So we also need something else here. And we, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this form handler. Okay, so we're, what we're going to do is we're going to want to invoke this method to submit our form. Okay, um, now that's wrong. That should be repair model. That's why I didn't update it earlier. So what we're going to do here is we're going to call this method and we're going to make a post uh, using the HTTP client to our endpoint. And then if it, we get success back, we're going to uh, show a success message and then we're going to reset the model so we can go again. So how do we actually invoke this? Well, we can actually get rid of the action and the method on here and we can use uh, one of Blaze's event handlers on submit. So this is same as JavaScript, except we put an at symbol in front of it, which makes it a, a, bla like a blazer event or razor event, depending on what you want to call it. Um, and then we can just say uh, handle form submit. So we're saying now when we hit the submit button, um, call our handle form submit method. So with all those bits in place, let's save that and we'll go back to the app and refresh. And I also think I've opened Firefox. Close that. So let's see what happens this time around. So we'll put Chris and we'll have my broken tap again and a plumber. Put a number in and hit save. And voila, we've now got repair saved successfully. And if I go over to my view repair over here, you can see that I've got my repair in. So it's successfully posted back to our API and the API has saved some data off. So that's actually worked perfectly fine, which is really cool. And we could leave it there except for one rather glaring issue. If I do this, it still worked. And if I go over here, I've now got really bad data being posted back to my API. So we haven't got any authorization, uh, uh, that's later. We haven't got any validation going on here. So that's not very good. So what can we do to improve this? Well, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go to our repair model and we're gonna update this model uh, with some validation rules. So what I'm doing here is I've added uh, data annotations to this particular model. Now, if you don't know what data annotations are, they're kind of the, the preferred validation rules for ASP.NET Core applications and .NET applications, I think, generally speaking. Um, and the way they work is that you decorate properties on your model with the particular uh, requirements, um, uh, validation requirements. So here I'm saying that the name field is required uh, the issue field is required and it must have a minimum length of 10. Um, down here, I've got the contact number and I've got this really nice succinct regular expression going over here uh, to make sure that it's a valid phone number um, and stuff like that. So, you know, you can specify whatever particular rules you want. You can even write your own um, validators as well that you can put on here. So that's, that's uh, quite useful. So I put that on there. I'm not uh, going to do anything else now. I'm just going to leave that as is and we'll go and have a look and just have a quick look at what's happened to our app now that we've done that. So let's see what happens. I'll hit save now and see what happens. Okay, nothing's really happened. So let's open up the console and actually if we look in here uh, on this now and I hit save. We're actually getting a 400 back from the API. And if we go in here and look at the result, we can actually see we're getting validation errors back from the API now. So in um, ASP.NET Core apps, um, validation's kind of there by default. You don't have to do anything other than add the attributes to your model. Um, and the API controls will automatically uh, validate that before they invoke your controller code, which is pretty cool. So uh, we've actually sorted out our problem from a server perspective. Uh, we can't post bad data anymore, which is good. 
However, we've got a really rubbish user experience now. There's nothing here telling the user that something's wrong, that they fail validation. So um, let's improve this. So uh, now we've done that, I'm going to update this form. So what I've done here is I've swapped the HTML form for a component that Blazor ships with called edit form. Now this is, a, as you can see, it's a drop-in replacement for the uh, uh, HTML form component, and it is configured slightly differently. So in order for this to work, we need to provide a model, um, and this is the model that the form's gonna work with. And then the edit form provides three events that we can use. We have on submit, which works the same way as an HTML on submit event. It will just invoke it whenever we uh, submit the form without question. And then there's another two that can be used together, and that is on valid submit and on invalid submit. Now on invalid submit, as you can probably guess, will get invoked if the form is invalid when you try to submit it. However, on valid submit, it's quite cool. Um, it will only invoke the handler if the, the validation rules for that form have passed. So when we fill out this form now and we hit save, um, because we're binding to on valid submit, handle form submit will only get fired if all of the validation rules in our model pass. So that's quite cool because that means that we don't actually have to worry about any validation code down here in our handle form submit um, method. We can just always assume that the model is in a valid state. So that's quite useful. What I've also done here is I've swapped the uh, regular HTML um, form components for Blazor components. So Blazor, again, provides drop-in replacements for all of the regular form stuff. So we have an input text here, which is the equivalent of an input with a type equals text. We have an input text area, an input select. You get the picture. Um, and the only other thing I've really had to do here is change how I'm binding. And I'm binding to this value with a capital V now. And that's because I'm binding to uh, a Blazor component and a, and a parameter on that component rather than a attribute on an HTML control. So that's why I'm using this slightly different syntax. But other than that, it's pretty much exactly the same. Um, you can see that I'm binding to the same uh, bits that I was on the model before, so that's all good. So let's see what happens now. Now we're using that. Let's see if we can get some validation errors this time. So if I hit save, still nothing. So that's not great. Now, the reason we're not getting any errors is because uh, Blazor's uh, form system, like pretty much everything else in Blazor really, has been built to be flexible and extensible and configurable, however you wanna do it. So while we're using these components, what we haven't done is told them which validation system we wanna use. Now, as I said, Blazor ships really with the default of data annotations, and it includes a data annotations validator component out of, out of the box. So all we actually need to do is include this data annotations validator, and that's going to tell the edit form that that's what we need to use to validate that model. Okay, so that wires all that up. That's all we need to do. And then I'm going to add in another component called a validation summary. And that's going to display any validation errors, error messages for us. So if I save that and go back over here, cool. If I hit save this time, now we're getting validation errors. So that validation summary is now listing out all the validation errors on the model. And also we're getting this nice kind of uh, color coding around the boxes. So if I go to uh, inspect one of these, we can actually see that because we're using those components provided by Blazor, it's applying CSS classes automatically for us um, so that we can style um, our inputs um, accordingly. So as this is currently invalid, it's getting a red border. But if I put a valid value in here and hit tab, we're now getting a green border and you can see down here that change from invalid to modified and valid, okay? So there's just a bit of styling that I've added here to do this. Um, you'd have to add that styling yourself based on these class names, but because they're there, you can do that. So this is now looking loads better. We're getting validation. We can't post up to our API, which is all good. There's a nice UX now. The only thing I'd like to really make a change here is to remove the validation summary and swap it for a slightly different validation component. So 
There's another one called a validation message that has a four parameter. And what we need to do is just give it a lambda here and, and tell it which particular uh, field on the model we want it to show um, validation messages for, like so. And I, I'll be honest, I prefer this one for one very simple reason. I think it's a nicer UX. Um, the uh, validation summary component is fine, but the problem with it is that it puts all the validation messages at the top of the, of the form. And if you've got a really long form, the user might have to actually scroll up and down to be able to see all those messages. And there's no real direct way of um, correlating which error message goes with which control. So that's, to me, the UX for that is not ideal. So if I swap it for a validation message, compo uh, a validation message component instead, we'll actually get the messages um, for that particular property displayed under the control itself, which I think is a much nicer way of doing things. So if we go on here now and hit save, we're now getting validation messages directly under the fields. And now when I fill them out, I can tab and they just go away again. So if I um, finish filling this in and say I've got my broken tap again, and I have, have a plumber, and I now need to provide a valid phone number, remember, because if I, I do that, that's actually valid, but if I do that, it's not. So um, we're getting phone number validation there, which is cool. Um, and if I hit save, we now save successfully. And if you go in uh, the view repairs, you can see I've got my broken tap, my plumber. So we successfully added forms. We've got validation going on so that we don't submit trash data. So that's all been pretty successful. Now, what I'd like to just point out is if you're not a fan of data annotations or you have a different preference, well, that's not an issue. As I mentioned earlier, the edit form is kind of agnostic of which uh, validation rule set you want to use. You just have to provide the relevant validator. So one of my open source packages is called Blazed Fluent Validation. And if you prefer using fluent validation for models, um, all you need to do is swap that out for a fluent validations validator. And um, yeah, you're good to go. Um, so you can, um, you can if you do want to use that instead, then uh, please check out my GitHub, um, the Blazed GitHub, and you can see examples of how you actually implement that. But essentially, you just install the NuGet package, add the validator, and you're ready to go. You can use Fluent Validations instead. You don't need to change anything else um, on your form, which is quite cool. We've got a quick question, actually, Chris, if that's okay. Go for um, it. What about validation errors in lists, please? Does the, boi does the binding sort those out? Validation in lists. Um, what uh, I can't think of what that would be. I.e. Like. list of trades. The fourth one is blank. Kieran's put a, an example on there. Uh, what this one, for example, is that? So at the moment, I've got nothing selected, but when I select one, that works. Is that? Kieran, yeah, is I'm that? On... Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. If he allows more than one trade, he's saying. Oh, so like a multi-select. So if you could select like carpenter and electrician, would it make sure that you've selected more than one? Is that? Let's go with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you were using, uh, if you were using multi-select, then yes, that, that should work. Yeah, I think that would. I'll, I'll be honest. I don't think I've actually done that flat out. Uh, just trying to think. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, because what you'd have uh, in the model backing it, I wonder if we could just code this up real quick. Um, I'm just trying to think how many other things this would break if I did this. <laughs> Let's try this, right? So if I said this was a list of uh, string, so this was, I'll leave that as like that. Uh, so we did that. And then what would I do? Do, I do select and that be multiple, multi, Paul, is that right for HTML? I think that's right. I'm curious now, I don't think I've actually tried this with a select like this before. Oh wow, I've really, there you go, I've really broken that. So, now I've turned it into a multi-select. Let me really quickly see if I can hack this so I can actually see what I'm doing. Uh, that one, uh, height, yeah, 20 pixels. No, need more than that. More height, more height, more height. 
Uh, so that's a multi-select now instead. So if I hit save, we should still see the same validation as before. And now I can select more than one trade on there now using you hold down shift and like multi-select like that. Uh, so that, oh, I haven't added a validation rule, have I? Uh, so that's required. What would that be? Uh, would it be minimum length? I know how to, I'll be honest, I tend to use fluent validations. I know exactly how you do, how I specify this rule with fluent validations. Um, but I don't know about checking length of lists with data annotations. If there's anybody in, does anybody actually know how to check length of lists on data annotations? No, oh, is it, it might just be length. Is it just mean length? Uh, not enough. Is that going to work? He uh, said not to oh. stress about it. If yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll be honest. I've just gone off on a right tangent, but I'm really curious now. Um, just going to see what this. If this doesn't work, I'll reverse this and, and go back. But theoretically, it should work fine. It, it would work with. Fluent validations, definitely. It's more, I think, my lack of knowledge of data annotations here. Um, so let me just really quickly uh, do that again. Uh, hi, uh, 100 BX, let's do that. Cool. Uh, so now if I hit save, select a trade, if I hit that, nah, I don't know. I think that's my lack of data annotations, but it should work. It should work fine. It should, like if you had, say there must be two, um, I would have thought that would have worked. That would work. It would work with fluent validation, so it should work with this perfectly fine as well. Um, like I said, I think it's just because I don't know the exact rule for that one. Um, let me just undo just, my... Yeah, go on. Sorry. I was just going to say, we've just got one more very quick question before we move on. Yeah, you are. Um, does component.scss work like shadow DOM here with, uh, with respective component? Asked by Rahul. Does component... Dot CSS. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm lost at that one again as well. Uh, let me go. Ah, I can see the chat window again now. Hold on. Sorry. He said no. <sighs> if not, we can always just come back to those at, at the end if that's easier. Oh, sorry, right. I'm, I'm sorry, I can see the chat now. Hold on. So does components has work like Shadow DOM here with respect to a component? Well, as in, is it isolated? Do you mean like, not like that, Rahul? Is that what you mean? Like CSS isolation? Is that what you're getting at? Uh, like viewing camps. Yeah, so there's no CSS isolation in Blazor at all. So everything's global. Um, the team are working on CSS isolation. I think it's one of the things they're looking at for .NET, uh, for .NET 5, which is obviously due for November. Um, I don't know if they've committed to actually delivering it or not. It's just something they're looking at. Um, but, but as of right now, there's no CSS isolation in, in Blazor. Um, I, I know a lot of people, um, I know a lot of people want to see it. I know it's a pretty highly requested feature. Um, so I'm sure it'll be coming along soon. I say, I know they're looking at it, but it's just not there yet. Cool, all right. So I think that's all the questions for now, isn't it? So I'll um, move on to yeah, the next. Yeah, thanks bit. so much for that, Chris. That's all right, no worries. Uh, cool, so what's the next bit we're gonna look at? Well, we've got our form working now. So let's, uh, let's do something with this dashboard. So we're gonna use some, Learn about JavaScript interop, and we're going to display a chart that displays some uh, information about the repairs in our system. We're going to display a chart that shows how many repairs we have that are completed versus not completed, because that's a good example. So um, first things first, um, to Java, JavaScript interop, why do we want to do it? Well, I, I kind of touched on this a bit last week. Um, there's a lot of really good JavaScript libraries out there that are really well battle tested, and really charts are a great example of that. Rerolling these by hand in C sharp is just going to be a lot of work and something you wouldn't want to do um, in the short term. Obviously, these will become native C sharp over time um, as Blazor sort of matures. 
But for right now, you can use JavaScript stuff pretty quickly and easily through uh, Blaze's interop APIs. And it's really not that scary to work with. Um, you can actually, and what I'm going to show you today is how you can wrap a JavaScript um, component so that um, you can work with it pretty much entirely in C Sharp. So once you've done that wrapping, um, you don't actually have to worry about the fact that it's JavaScript under the hood. Um, and then even in the future, if uh, web, once WebAssembly can get some access to the DOM perhaps, um, you could then just refactor it to use those APIs instead of the interop APIs without changing any of your calling code. So it kind of future-proofs you a bit as well, which is good. So in order to do that, I'm gonna open up this JS uh, folder. So in here, I've got a, uh, a JavaScript library called Chart.js, which is a fairly popular charting library. So we're just gonna wrap that and see how, that, how easy that is to do really. So to start off with, I'm gonna add another JavaScript file. So I'm already adding two JavaScript files to my Blazor app, so I'm completely throwing away the no JavaScript ones. Uh, and I'm gonna call this one uh, chartwrapper.js. So we'll get that, and then what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna ping in some code. I'm gonna collapse a load of it because I don't want you to care about the majority of this because it's gonna be boilerplate and we'll replace it in a minute. So what I've done here, this bit in the middle, for now, all I want you to know about this is that this is boilerplate uh, code for uh, instantiating a new chart using Chart.js. And this is literally copy and pasted off of their getting started guide. I've not done anything special with this at all. Um, so don't worry about that too much. So I'll collapse that. The bits that I do want you to care more about are these couple of bits here. So the way that Blazor, uh, Blazor's JavaScript interop works is it can invoke anything that's uh, on the global scope, so attached to the window object. So what I could do here is I could put a function directly on the window object and then invoke it from, from Blazor, and I'll show you that in a second. But the problem is there, I could hit naming collisions. There could be another function with the same name as build chart, for example. So what, I, what tends to be a good practice is to kind of namespace your code by creating an object and then putting your function within that object. So I've created one here called Blazor Repairs, which is attached to the window object. And then I've created this function called build chart in it that takes an element, okay? And all I do there is pass that element into this new uh, chart function, which is provided by chart.js, and that creates a new chart. And that chart just renders in that element that we pass in. So that's, that's all that's going on here, and that's all I really want you to worry about right now. So I'll save that. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is just gonna add some references to those scripts into my uh, index.html here. So I've got those. So now I've done that, I'm gonna show this in the dashboard. So following that feature folder approach, I'm gonna add a new component to the dashboard uh, feature. I'm gonna call it uh, chart. And we'll add that. Cool. And then I'm gonna paste in a bit of code for that. Now I'm gonna shut this down and reopen this because you might notice there's no highlighting here. This is actually because I'm using a preview version of Visual Studio and there's a weird bug at the moment where it's not picking this up. So I'm just gonna close that and reopen it and then ping, everything comes back to life. Um, so let's have a quick walkthrough about what's going on here. So first of all, in the markup, I'm just using a regular HTML canvas element here. There's nothing special about this, but what I am doing is using Blazor's ref directive to capture a reference to this and that's, uh, so I can pass it down to that JavaScript uh, uh, function we were just looking at. And I'm recording that reference in this private field with this type of element reference, which is provided by Blazor. And then I'm, over, I'm uh, overriding one of the uh, lifecycle methods on Blazor's components. There's three of these. There's on initialized, on parameter set, and on after render. Now, on after render is the one you want to use when you're doing JavaScript interop. And there's two reasons for that. The first one is because if we were using Blazor server, uh, we have pre-rendering turned on by default, which means um, if you did your JavaScript call in one of the other lifecycle methods, um, you would actually end up getting an error because it would try and execute your JavaScript interop while it was doing a pre-render on the server. And there's no browser and there's no JavaScript um, runtime available there. So it would all blow up. Job, uh, on after render is a special method that is not called during pre-render specifically so that you can do these interop calls in it and not blow it up in a pre-render scenario. So that's why one of the reasons you want to use it. The other reason is because the majority of the time when you're doing JavaScript interop, you're taught, you probably want to reference a, a, a 
an element in some way, shape or form like we're doing here, we want to pass a reference to this canvas element. Now, if we try to do it in one of the earlier lifecycle methods, there's no um, guarantee. In fact, the chances are that the UI hasn't rendered at that point. So um, we actually wouldn't be able to pass a reference because it wouldn't exist. So this ref would be null because the canvas hadn't been painted at that point. So on after render ensures that the actual DOM elements are in place so that we can capture a reference to. So they're the two reasons you want to use on after render. Um, it also takes this, uh, has this bool of first render as well. This is quite useful if you're doing anything um, that only wants to run once. So um, you can say on the first render of a, of a component, execute this call, but on subsequent renders, don't. Um, obviously on after render gets called every time a component re-renders. So any component may re-render multiple times in its life cycle. So if you only want something to execute once, then you can wrap it in a, in a check for first render um, and do that. So that's quite cool. So inside of on after render, we're using JS runtime, which we're injecting at the top here using Blaze's inject attribute. So that's how we can inject stuff into our, into our component. Um, and we're injecting IJS runtime. Now, uh, IJS runtime has two methods on it. So if I just hit that, we can see in Telesense here, we've got invoke async and invoke void async. Um, these are probably quite explanatory. Uh, invoke async, uh, we can use to call into JavaScript and get a return value. Um, invoke void async is when we call into JavaScript, but we, it's just a void call. We're not expecting a, a return value. So this is what we're going to use here. It takes, um, as its first argument, it takes the function that we want to invoke. So this is always relative to that global scope, that window object. So you can see here, we've got blazed repairs dot build chart, which uh, corresponds to our blazed repairs build chart um, that we set up in our JavaScript. And then after that, it's just a params array. So we can pass as many variables down to, to JavaScript as we want. So in this case, we want to just pass this element reference down and Blaze is going to take care of the whole marshalling for us. Um, and it will just convert that to an element reference that JavaScript can understand. Um, so, so that's um, what that component's doing. So you can see that to run JavaScript, all we've had to do is write one line of C sharp code, which is pretty cool. So now we've done that, let's actually put this to work. So if I go in here and I type chart, we can get in some IntelliSense here and I can put in my chart component into my dashboard. And now if we refresh this, let's have a look and see what happens. Excellent. So with those few lines of code, we've now got a JavaScript chart rendering pretty well. Okay. And it's rendering this dummy data that that's been part that um, was included in all that code that I quickly, uh, folded down because it was a bit irrelevant. So that's all that that code was doing. It's just got this dummy data in it. So that's a pretty good start, but as it stands at the moment, this is not overly useful to us, okay? Um, we've got hard-coded data, which is rubbish. So what we're gonna do now is we're actually gonna replace a load of this hard-coded stuff um, with data that we can uh, work with at the uh, C-sharp end rather than working with this in JavaScript. So there's a couple of bits that we're going to swap. So at the moment we have a hard coded that we're going to display a bar chart and then we have this data that we're going to do here. So instead of doing that, we're going to pass this stuff in instead. So we're going to pass in the type and we're going to pass in the data that we want displayed. So what we can do now is just replace these uh, bits here with those bits. So I'll do that. This is now data. So by doing that, we've essentially made this boilerplate, really boilerplate now. Um, it uh, can be used with any type or any data that we, uh, we can read any type of chart or any data that we pass into it. Um, this options object is again, it's just got some uh, defaults in it that I'm not going to worry about, but you could also move this up in the same way that I'm going to show you. So you could almost take that as homework if you want to play around with that. Um, but for now, you kind of get the idea that we can just pass these values in instead. So now I've done that, I'm actually going to uh, close that because we don't care about that anymore. That's just boilerplate code that we're not going to touch. Um, everything else that we're going to do now, we're going to work with in C Sharp. So um, now we've done that, uh, what we need to do is create a class to represent that data structure that we just removed from, from the JavaScript world. So I'm going to create a, a new, uh, uh, hold on. 
I'm going to create a new C-sharp class called chart data. And oh, lost my cursor. And do, 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 do. there we go. So again, you don't need to worry about this too much specifically, but essentially what this is, is a C-sharp representation of that data structure that was in JavaScript. So we had a list of labels, we had a, a list of data sets, and then a data set contain some other various bits of information. Like I say, it, it's not really that important. It's more the technique that you need to kind of uh, care about. So uh, we've now got a C-sharp version of that data structure that we can work with. So that's cool. So we can uh, close that now because we don't really need to worry about that too much. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add a couple of parameters onto our chart uh, component. So the reason we're doing this is because um, we obviously want whoever consumes this chart component to be able to pass in the data and specify what type of chart they want to render, because otherwise this component's not very reusable. So that's what we're doing here. So this is how we create like a public API for our components. We just create public properties and they do have to be public um, and you decorate them with this parameter attribute. And now they're available uh, for, for use by consuming uh, components. Um, the, the only other thing really we need to do now is pass that uh, additional information down into JavaScript. So we're going to pass down the type like so, and we're going to pass down the data uh, that we want to render. And that's really all we've got to do there. That's everything to make that work. And again, we don't really now need to worry about the chart component. That's nicely reusable. And we can now manipulate it from where we're using it, which is inside of our dashboard. So I'm going to paste in quite a chunk of code here because we've now moved a lot of the responsibility up to whatever the component is that you're using it. So what we're doing, oh, that is old. Let's get our JSON now. Um, so what we're doing here now is firstly, we've updated the markup. So we're now passing in a data and a type of chart that we want to display um, for, for this dashboard. So uh, we have this chart data object, which is specified. Uh, we've created this down here in our code block. So first of all, I've got a private field called chart data, which is this, um, that chart data object that we created a second ago. And then what I'm doing is making a call to the API. I'm using on initialize. So this only fires once in the life cycle of a Blazor component. And it's great for doing exactly what I'm doing here, which is um, going and getting initial data. So I'm making an HTTP call there. I'm going to just check why my IntelliSense is throwing a wobbly. It's because I'm missing a using statement, I think. Uh, uh, hold on. get from Jason I think there we go um, so that's going to get some initial data back from our API which includes uh, a list of our well it's basically a list of our repairs um, which includes the, the um, ones that are completed and ones that aren't completed and then it's going to pass that into this uh, create chart data method down here and all that does is construct an instance of that chart data object with all of the various bits of information and we're using a bit of link here to like work things out. Again, you don't need to worry about the details as such. Um, just trust that that's what it's doing. So with all of that done and in place, if we save that, let's go and have a look at what's happening to our dashboard now. Cool. So now we're actually rendering useful data. So we're now seeing our completed repairs, which is five versus our outstanding repairs that's three. And if I go over to the view repairs page, you can see that there's three non-complete ones and five complete ones. So this isn't dummy data. This is the real data from the API. So that's pretty cool. And the great thing is now we can work with this entirely in C-sharp. So say, for example, I don't want to buy a bar chart anymore. I want a pie chart. I can just change it here in C-sharp. I haven't got to go into any JavaScript. I can now reload my app. and we now have a pie chart. So it's doing the same thing, outstanding repairs, completely repairs. So this is quite cool. We've now basically taken, we've taken everything out of JavaScript that we can really, pushed it all up to C Sharp, and now we've created that nice C Sharp wrapper around the JavaScript library itself, and we can now just consume this as a, C, uh, as a, uh, a regular Blazor component, um, and we don't really need to care anymore that it's using JavaScript under the hood. Um, and later on, like I say, if WebAssembly suddenly gets the 
uh, ability to manipulate the DOM. We could just adjust those calls in our chart component and um, all of our consuming components don't need to worry about it anymore, which is cool. So that's JavaScript interop. Uh, there's obviously a lot more advanced stuff um, to do with this, but um, this is just kind of give you a flavor of hopefully how sort of relatively simple it is to work with JavaScript and Blazor. So have we got any questions in that section? Uh, we've had a couple. Um, what's better at ref or get element build? I can't say this. <laughs> <laughs> get element by ID. So, so get, so get element by ID is a JavaScript call. So um, I, why, you, I mean, you could use that if you want to, but that's just more JavaScript you've got to write. Um, it, whereas if you use ref, you're staying in Blazor. Um, in terms of future proofing, if WebAssembly gets access to the DOM, you won't need to go back and cut out more JavaScript code and then add a ref attribute into Blazor because you use get element by ID. Uh, you'd just be able to carry on using at ref. So I would always prefer the Blazor stuff over the JavaScript stuff for the majority of circumstances, unless there's a really, really good reason why you can't do that. Cool. And then the only other thing really was a comment from Andrew uh, about the issues with Chart.js. I'm not sure what you think about that. Uh, issue with Chart.js is that callbacks which don't work with promises, things such as labels require this. If you can live with WebAssembly, uh, can do this with synchronous calls. Uh, I'll be honest, I plucked Chart.js uh, out because it was a relatively popular library. I'll be honest, I've not really used it loads. Um, so I've not dealt with these bits, but in terms of uh, callbacks and things, you can do callbacks from JavaScript to C sharp code with Blazor. Um, so if it does need callbacks, that works. Um, I don't know, I'm guessing from that comment, you've, it, are you saying Chart.js doesn't work with promises? Ah, uh, right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, in that case, then, yeah, there's not a lot you can do about that. <laughs> but Blazor does. So um, in a more advanced, in more advanced JavaScript scenarios, um, you can call JavaScript, you can get JavaScript code to invoke C sharp methods, um, both instance methods and static methods. Um, you can um, have that set up so that JavaScript can do that automatically, um, maybe when the app first boots up. So if you want to say, uh, a good example might be you register an event listener um, for a scroll event, for example, when your Blazor app first boots up and you want that to call the C-sharp method whenever that uh, event handler fires, you can set that up using JavaScript in the ROP absolutely fine. So, so, just to, uh, so just to be clear, really, Blazor can handle doing uh, callbacks promises and it can work with async and non-async stuff absolutely fine. Um, so that's all possible. Um, it's just a bit too advanced for doing this. Can we call TypeScript using IJS runtime instead of JavaScript? No, nope, because TypeScript isn't executed in the browser, JavaScript is. So you can write TypeScript, have it compiled to JavaScript, and then include JavaScript um, tag. So if you need to do, uh, so for example, what we were looking at here, if you wanted to write chart wrapper uh, using TypeScript instead of JavaScript, you could do that. You would need TypeScript, uh, a toolchain set up to compile that down to JavaScript but um, you can't call TypeScript in that way. Uh, back to the form new repair. Uh, there is no radio button in Blazor. Uh, which radio button control do you suggest? The Rasden one, the DevExpress one, the Telerik one? Uh, you're right, there isn't actually a radio button in Blazor, but if you look on the Blazor docs under forms, uh, they actually show you how to create one for yourself. Um, so you don't need to use a third party one, you can just write them your, yourself. Um, and, and like I say, let me bring that up real quick because uh, you can tell I go on here all the time because that's just instantly in my list and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. So if we go to uh, forms and validation in Blazor uh, and we scroll down a bit, uh, work with radio buttons. Uh, they actually give you literally copy and paste code that you can use to create uh, radio buttons right there. So you can just copy that code paste it into a component in your app and you have a radio button. If your next question is gonna be, why is that not out of the box? I don't have the answer to that question. They wrote that, they wrote that in the docs. I don't know why, why it's not a component built in because uh, they've obviously done all the work. Um, it, it may just turn up. Um, 
I don't have the answer to that one. I should have asked that the other week, but I didn't. Um, if I when I next speak to anyone in the Blazer team, I'll, I'll ask that question out of curiosity. Uh, but um, but yeah, but if you want a radio button, use that one. You don't have to go and get any third party controls. Uh, would you not put JS in head? Uh, especially you are also calling post render for purposes of validation. Would I not put so generally speaking, I wouldn't put JavaScript in the head element because um, loading JavaScript tends to be blocking unless you're using like the async modifier. So usually best practice is to load JavaScript at the end of your, uh, your, your um, uh, body tag, because uh, again, if your JavaScript, um, by doing that as well, you're ensuring that your DOM's actually there. So that if your JavaScript tries to call any of it, it's rendered. Whereas theoretically, if you try and load JavaScript in the head tag, there's technically a chance that the DOM's not in place. Um, so that's at least my understanding of everything. Not per W3C validations. You possibly know something that I don't then. I've always been under the impression that, Java, that um, JavaScript should always be loaded at the end of the body tag, um, unless I've missed something. I'm not understanding your question. Validators. I, I have a feeling I've not understood your question, SK. Sorry, I, I can't see the rest now. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I'm not entirely sure what you're asking. Um, I'm guessing it's not generally about JavaScript scripts. I'm guessing it's something about very, something very specific. Um, so yeah. Apologies, if you can rephrase that a bit. So HTML validate is what I'm referring to. Oh, okay. Well, uh, with obviously the validators we've, we've been using so far today, that, that's nothing to do with HTML validation whatsoever. This is all to do with the built-in validation system in Blazor. Um, it doesn't use the, I'm guessing you're kind of referring to the HTML5 validators maybe, uh, but they're, they're not used in, in this scenario. It's all built-in stuff in Blazor. Does that make sense? Dot type hack. Yeah, the demo project's already on my GitHub. I'll post a link to it at the end, but it's already there. So um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll point you out that towards the end. Sorry, SK. I, 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 I'll be honest, I really don't think I've understood what you meant. So um, we can maybe talk about this in a bit um, towards the end or at the end of the, the rest of the talk. And I'll try and, um, I'll try and uh, uh, come up with a good answer for you. Um, what we'll do then is we'll move on to kind of the, the final bit really, which is the authentication and authorization stuff. So at the moment, uh, our app's working pretty well. We've got our dashboard with our graph. We've got our new repair form. We've got our view repair. Uh, list, but nothing's got any protection. This is all perfectly um, like uh, easy for anyone to view, which is pretty rubbish. So how can we add some validation into all of this? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off uh, on the server. So this is a really good thing to, to, to get hammered from the get-go. Uh, Blazor being a SPAR application, uh, and specifically WebAssembly version here, um, it's a client-side application. It's like a desktop app or any other SPA framework. They can't be trusted. So anything that we're going to do with Blazor WebAssembly uh, to do authentication and authorization is purely to provide a good UX to the user. Okay, All the code is accessible for them. They can decompile it. They can modify it. So anything we do there is purely cosmetic. So the most important thing for us to start off with is to secure the API. So in order to do that, I'm going to put an authorize attribute on our API controller. So this is the uh, controller that we've been calling uh, in, the, in this demo so far. So I'm just adding that authorize attribute on the top. And by doing that, if I refresh this page, um, it should be broken straight away. We shouldn't see any, any repairs being loaded anymore because it's now, uh, we're not valid anymore. There we go. So we've got no repairs coming back there. And if we go to our dashboard, we won't get a graph anymore either because we can't make API calls anymore. So we've done the most important thing here, which is to secure our server. That's the most important thing because that's the thing we can actually control. So um, while we're here, I'll just quickly explain what's going on with the validation here. Now, a lot of what I've done here is quite bespoke and I've hand rolled it purely 
for the purposes of this demo, I wouldn't recommend copying this. Um, so what this is doing is it's using uh, JSON bearer tokens to do validation. Now this is quite a common technique for SPAR applications. It's pretty much the, the standard really. Um, but I haven't used any uh, identity provider to do this. I've hand rolled this. Now don't do that, use another identity provider. So either use um, ASP.NET Core's identity system um, or use something like Azure B2C or some equivalent like Auth0 or whatever to do this stuff. Um, because it's very easy to get wrong. So what I've done here is I've set up um, the uh, various services. So I've added in the authentication services. I've told um, the app that we're gonna be using bearer tokens and I've configured some options for those bearer, bearer tokens as well. Um, and then down here, uh, I've added in some middleware to say that we wanna use authentication and authorization. Um, in terms of logging in, I have a login controller that uh, will allow us to log in. I'm using hard-coded username and password. So again, don't do this. This is very, very bad, um, but it works for a demo. Um, so that's what's going on, on on the API end. We don't really need to worry about uh, a lot of that um, that's going on there. So that's the server end secured. So let's turn our attention to Blazor. So uh, Blazor actually can use a lot of the same, uh, or does use a lot of the same stuff that we would use on an ASP.NET Core application. So what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to go through here and I'm just going to collapse all over this so I can see what I'm getting at easier. Excuse me. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add that same authorized attribute to all of the pages in our app. Okay so this is the same one that we just added in the API and we can add attributes to our Blazor components using the attribute directive like this. So I've added that to the dashboard page. I'm also going to add it to the new repair page and we're gonna add it to the view repair page as well. So we've added it into all of them now. So that's cool, but that actually isn't gonna do anything for us. It's not gonna work out of the box like the, the API, uh, uh, the authorized attribute did on the API. Uh, we need to kind of tell Blazor what authorized means to us. And in order to do that, we're gonna uh, create something uh, called an, uh, a token authentication state provider. So I'm gonna create a folder here I'm going to call that providers. And I'm going to add a new class. Uh, there we go. So I'll call that token authentication state provider like so. And then in here, I'm going to pop in some code. And now I've realized that I got my copy paste points wrong. Let me just clean that up. Lovely. Now, again, I'm showing you this to give you an idea of what's going on under the hood. If you're using any of the kind of traditional ways of doing this, so uh, like I say, ASP.NET Core's identity system, which uses identity server under the hood, uh, Azure B2C, Azure AD, things like that, there are providers already written for you. I'm just showing you the nuts and bolts of what's going on. So, all of Blaze's authentication and authorization components use this authentication state provider, okay? Um, we cascade that down to them, and I'm gonna show you that in a second. Um, but they use that internally, and what they do is they call a method on it called get authentication state async. So we, uh, when we provide our implementation of this, um, we need to override that method. And what this method is essentially doing is returning back to the caller whether we are authenticated or not. So, here, I'm telling, uh, I'm telling Blazor what authenticated means for this particular app. Like I said, if you're using out of the box stuff, this is all taken care of for you, don't need to worry. But if you do wanna do anything bespoke, you, will, uh, you may wanna write one of these um, providers and this is how you do it. So what I'm doing here is I'm checking in local storage for the presence of a, a, a token. Now that's there because I've got a couple of helper methods here called login and log out and on login, um, I, I save the token to local storage and on log out, I remove it from local storage. Um, so that's how we know whether we're logged in or logged out. And what I do here is retrieve it. If I've got a token, then the next thing I do is I construct a claims identity. So this is all part of the normal stuff that's present in the ASP.NET Core. If I've not got a token, I get an empty claims identity. Otherwise I uh, pass the token um, and, and create a claims identity from that. 
The next thing I do is I'm uh, adding a, the authorization header to the default HTTP client. Um, if there isn't a token, then I, I basically null it. So if there was, if we were logged in and we'd logged out, it cleans it up. Otherwise, um, it doesn't do anything. But if we, if we are uh, trying to make an authenticated call, it will add an authorization header with bearer and the token. Now, again, you don't need to do this in the default template. In fact, I'm gonna show you this after because I'm, I really want you to understand that you don't need to do all of this. I'm just showing you nuts and bolts stuff. So once that's happened, I'm then returning a new authentication state. And this is the key point. So that's based on the claims principle, which is based on that identity that we were constructing up here. So if this is an empty identity, then basically it's the same as saying I'm logged out. But if it's a populated identity, then I'm logged in. That's really what this is doing. So you can think of this as literally a Boolean uh, response, really. Either you're logged in or you're logged out. So once we've got that in place, we now need to add stuff to dependency injection to make all this work. So dependency injection for Blazor WebAssembly is done in the program main method. We don't have a startup class in Blazor WebAssembly. Um, it doesn't really make sense in Blazor WebAssembly. There's only two methods in a startup class. Uh, one of them is called configure, and it's used to configure middleware. There is no middleware in Blazor WebAssembly, so that means we'd have a startup class just to have one method in it, which is pointless. So we can do all of our configuration here. So I'm going to paste those um, services in. And I'm going to add some using statements. And I'll talk you through what's going on in here. So firstly, I'm uh, adding authorization here. So this is very similar to what I did in the API. And this configures all the services that are needed for authorization in the Blazor app. I've then also used another one of my packages, so Blazor Local Storage, that allows me to interrupt with local storage um, using C-sharp APIs instead of having to do JavaScript interrupt myself. And then what I'm doing is I'm adding that token authentication state provider that we just created uh, into, the, into the DI container as a scoped service. Um, and then what I'm then doing in the next line is I'm saying that any uh, service that requests uh, authentication state provider get my token authentication state provider from DI and return that instead, okay? And that's because authentication state provider is an abstract class. So we need to provide the actual implementation. So this is then gonna get caught, whenever any of Blazor's components ask for an instance of authentication state provider, they're gonna get our token authentication state provider instead. So that's what's going on in there. The next thing that we need to do is configure Blazor's router, and that is in uh, the app component. So the app component is the default entry point for your Blazor application. So what we need to do in here is we need to set up a couple of things. So first thing is we need to set up a cascading authentication state component, and that is going to cascade that um, token authentication state provider to all of the components um, within Blazor. So that's what we need to set that up for. The next thing that we're gonna do is gonna update this area here. Um, so by default, Blazor uses this root view component to display page components. But the problem is with root view component, it doesn't understand that authorized attribute. So it won't check to see whether we're authorized before it loads it. So that's not any good. So we're gonna swap that for a different component. And this component's called authorized root view. Now, authorized root view is exactly the same as root view, except it does understand that authorized attribute. So it can uh, make sure that we're authorized before it sends us to a page. If we're not authorized, we can specify a not authorized template and we can uh, tell it what we want to do instead. So in this instance, we're saying if we're not authorized, we want you to show the login component. So the last thing here that we need to do is in the login uh, uh, feature here, I just need to uncomment this code because I've got it commented out for now. So the login component is going to get displayed when the, whenever we're not logged in. And just to quickly whip you through this, we're injecting that token authentication state provider that we just created. We've got an edit form here that's displaying a username and password for us to enter. And then down here in our uh, submit handler, we're making a call to the API, that login controller we looked at. We're waiting for a response. And then if we get a successful response, then that means we're logged in. Um, and then we're going to save that token off to local storage using that login method on that token authentication state provider I showed earlier. Otherwise, we're gonna show an error message. So 
with all those various bits in place, I think we should be ready to reload the app and see what happens. Cool. So now, wherever we go, we're getting that logging component. And that's that router now stopping us going anywhere. So what I can do now uh, is I can log in as a user. I can now access everything I can access before. So I'm now authorized. So if I go into uh, the browser tab here and I go to application, I can actually go and look in local storage and I can actually see that token. So you can see there that token saved in local storage. Um, if you're curious as to what that looks like, um, let's save that off. You can go and you can actually decrypt these things. So you can go something like jwt.ms and paste in the code and you can see some information about it. So you can see that I've got some roles here. So we've got a claim, sorry. So the, I've got a name claim of user. I've got a role of user. I've got an issuer and an audience set up and there's an expiry for the token as well. So you can view all of that from that token, but that's where it's all sitting. So that's all good. But what happens if we want to restrict things further? What happens if we want to authorize areas based on user role? Let's have a look at that bit. So what we're going to say is that uh, while we've got all this stuff in place, we actually only want the view repairs page to be accessible to users who are in a certain role and a role uh, we're going to, uh, that's a role of planner. So I'm going to add some code here. I'm going to wrap um, all of that code that was there before in this uh, authorized root, root view, uh, authorized, sorry, authorized view component. Now the authorized view component allows us to uh, sort of show and hide bits of API depending on uh, the authorization status. So in this case, I'm saying that in order to see what's in the authorized template, you have to be authorized in the role of planner. If that's the case, then you're going to get the card that we saw before listing out all of the issues. But if you're not authorized, then you're going to see a card that has this sort of error message saying that you're not authorized, you don't have permission. So I'll save that and let's have a look what happens on our view repairs page now. Bear in mind, remember, I'm logged in as a user at this point. Cool. So now we're seeing our not authorized template. I can still go to my repair page, add repair, because that hasn't got any restrictions. Um, outside of being logged in, but view repairs, I can now no longer get to it. The only other problem we've got is that at the moment, there's no way to log out. I could manually go into the browser dev tools, delete the token out of local storage, and that would effectively log me out, but that's a bit rubbish. So let's see if we can improve the UI a bit here. So to do that, I'm gonna go into, not my styles folder, I'm gonna flap some of this so I can see what I'm doing. I'm gonna go in shared layout, and in, I'm gonna put this in the header bar here, and I'm gonna create a new component. I'm going to call this one user status like this. I'll plonk some code in here as well, and then I'll reload it as per that error I showed you earlier. There we go. So here I'm using authorized view again, but I'm using it in a slightly more simplistic way. So you can see I'm not demanding a role of any kind, and I'm also not specifying a template internally. When you use it in this way, what you're saying is um, anybody who's authorized, I logged in, can see whatever's inside of it. Okay, so you only need to use the authorized and not authorized templates when you've got sort of harsher rules or you want to show conditional UI. In this case, I, I, there's no condition. If you're not logged in, I don't want to show any of this. So that's what's going to happen. That's why there's no templates in there. Um, inside of here, um, what's good about the authorized view is we get access to this context object. And from there, we get access to the user claims principle. So um, that's really cool. So you probably use this if you've done ASP.NET core work before, and you can go user.identity.name to print out the name of the user. You can also uh, look at other stuff on here. So you can look at claims, other identities, stuff like that. Um, it's the same as you've used in .NET core before. And then the last bit in here is a button. And what we've got here is an on-click handler. And now I'm just doing an, a, a sort of inline um, method uh, method call here. I'm saying when you click this button, call the logout method on the token authentication state provider that I injected above, and that will log us out. 
So that's done. The only other thing I've got to do now is actually add that to our header here. So I've got a header bar. I'm just going to add uh, the user status component in here like so. Save that. Refresh the page. And now we've got some sort of nicer UI. We can see uh, high, you can see high name. Um, I can log out, so I can do that. And that gives me the login button, a uh, login function. I can say planner, and login as a planner instead. And I can get the password wrong. I can get it right, and I can log in as a planner. And you can see now it's saying, hello, planner. Um, and I can access everything that I could before. Everything's working as it was. So that is authentication for you. Now, like I said, I've hand rolled a lot of stuff here because it's kind of to show you sort of some more nuts and bolts stuff. I wouldn't recommend doing a lot of what I've done um, here because around the tokens especially, uh, because there's much better ways of doing that um, using out of the box stuff. So um, what I'm just gonna do quickly is I will open up another instance of Visual Studio. Uh, that one then, there we go. Now I was playing around this uh, to look at some unit testing uh, stuff that someone asked in the meetup group, but I, I've, I've got this set up for auth as well. So I'll show you what auth looks like out of the box. I also did a really, uh, I also did a stream uh, a week or two ago uh, with Telerik. Um, and I talked specifically about authorization. So if you wanna learn more about the out of the box stuff, um, you can go and check that out off of um, Telerik's site and I'll find the URL for you. Um, so let me just get rid of this because this is all like junk around the testing stuff that we don't need to worry about. Um, so this is the same project template we saw, but this is using out of the box. This is using um, uh, the uh, ASP.NET identity system, which uses identity server under the hood. So I think I haven't run this yet. So this should all spin up okay because I don't think I've got any build errors and we can have a look what this looks like instead. So bear in mind, I've just done a file new project here and selected a couple of tick boxes. I haven't actually done any manual configuration whatsoever in order for this to work. So first of all, you'll see that it's slightly different from the, the, the standard templates. I've got these login and register buttons. Okay, they're included out of the box. If I go to register, I now get forwarded to the identity pages. Now this is no longer a Blazor page. This is forwarded us to the server and this is rendering server pages. So this is Razor pages, it's actually rendering right now. So I can actually create an account. Like so, and hit register. Oh, miss failed. Password. Try that again. So I can now register a new account. Now this is the first time I've run this app and this is using any framework behind the scenes. So it's saying that I need to apply some migrations in order for this to work. So I'm gonna run those migrations. There we go. It's now applied those migrations. I can refresh the page and it's now created my account. Now, normally this could send an email to confirm, but because obviously we're just using this as a test app, we've got this handy link to confirm the account, which is confirmed. And now I can click login. I can come back over here. And I can log in and now we get redirected back to the Blazor page. And now you can see I'm a logged in user. You can see um, it's got my information up here. I'm now, uh, I've now got a logout link instead of login. Um, the fetch data page is actually restricted by default. So that now works. But if I log out, for example, and now I go back to fetch data, it's redirected me to log in. Okay. So this is all out of the box. I haven't had to configure anything manually for this. This all just works. And that's because that provider I, I showed you. Uh, earlier that's all pre-configured for you so um, you don't need to worry about writing all the stuff that I showed you today you can just use these, these bits out of the box 
Um, there's also some other cool stuff. So I just want to quickly highlight that while we're here. So Blazor comes uh, when you, when you uh, use the auth templates now, Blazor comes with some extra components to, to kind of handle a lot of the uh, ceremony of authorization. Um, so it comes with an authentication page. And this handles doing all of the redirect stuff. So this is the page that sends you off to those Razor pages. When the callback from those Razor pages comes back again, this handles that. It takes the token out of the URL. It saves it. It does all of that stuff for you. So that is all handled for you uh, by uh, this particular page and specifically the remote authenticator view component. So that all happens out of the box. This all works as well with Azure AD B2C, Azure AD. Um, this component handles all of that as well. Um, under the hood, uh, Blazor out of the box supports the MSAL library um, from, from, um, from Microsoft. Um, and I think the OIDC client library as well. Um, so it covers you for any OIDC compliant provider out of the box. Um, so that's all in there. We have um, this login display component, which is what was showing our name and the login link. So you can see that how uh, similar to what we looked at in my app. So we've got login and register there in the uh, not authorized. We have the, the name and the logout button in the authorized template. So you can see how that works. Um, you have something called a session state manager, sign out session state manager that you can use to trigger sign out and stuff like that. Obviously the login happens on the Razor pages, so you don't have to worry about that right now. Uh, it has a, uh, this redirect to login component, um, which does that uh, redirect stuff. Again, that's kind of all built in for you. You don't need to worry about that. So like I said, when you're doing uh, all stuff, definitely try not to roll it yourself. Use what's provided out of the box. So that kind of brings us to a close really of what I've got anyway. So um, I think we'll turn ourselves over to questions. There's been a couple asked during that. Um, how would you work with resource-based authorization? How would I work with resource-based authorization? Um, what, do you, what do you mean in terms of what, Andrew? Like, what 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 do you define what do you you mean by resource feel free to come off mute and ask the question if you'd prefer that be easier. yeah it's probably easier <laughs> <laughs> save my fingers um so i've written a razor page app um currently and when the world catches up and goes blazer i'd love to port it over to blazer mm -hmm. um it does, it's got a separate authorization, resource-based authorization handler in the server side of things. Um, so I guess, I guess it would, um, role-based is great if you want like uh, policies and you know about these things up front and you can look at them in your, um, you, you can pull them from, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, your credentials. So not that. From, from the token, do you mean, the claims? Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that'll be the one, begins with a C. <laughs> um, whereas when you, let's say you're, uh, you've got a, a, the equivalent of a multi-tenant thing. So I can see, uh, I can see my um, to-do list, I'm going to say, or a group of people's to-do lists. So therefore I authorize against something that's a little bit more complicated. that can't necessarily be known about upfront on the client. How would you manage that? Oh, I guess, um, I would, how would I do that? I would probably, I mean, I'd still do that with either a role or a policy. I think I would, I mean, you must have some way of identifying what user is about, like allowed to see which to do list. If we yeah, follow your example. So, so you could in in Razor or or MVC, you could you basically or and web API, you could basically write a custom authorization handler. Yeah. Um there's a whole series of things and it goes a little bit, you have to go off and do a lot of digging to get to how, how to do it. And you can't really do it with a policy. Oh, okay. Um but I mean I guess the point here being is that you don't know if someone's authenticated. Or, or so more importantly, authorized to do something or an action yeah. until they've gone to it. So you probably get four or three back from the server. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, I, I don't think I've probably done the exact scenario you're doing. 
um, with a custom um, handle like that. I, I might look into this actually. So that be that might be quite an interesting one because um, obviously if people are, are doing what you're doing and looking to move to Blazer, it'd be good to have an answer for that question. Um, but I mean, I was just thinking if you if you were if you know that the user's author like authenticated, but you're not sure if they're authorized. When they hit the endpoint, you could then make a call to go and see if they're allowed to get whatever they are allowed to get. But I don't know if that's a bit rudimentary. Yeah, <laughs> so you'd have that's, to have that that's code the only way I can see about doing that. I was just wondering if there's an, an, whether I'm missing missing a trick or not. Yeah, I mean, what one thing I would say about this, and I think what's probably really a, a pertinent point to make about this is it's definitely not a problem with Bla it's not a Blazor problem. Um, no. This is an API problem because, like I said to you. Nothing that you do in Blazor is secure, but you know, you're, you're, everything we've done here could be decompiled, it could be manipulated, it could be fiddled around with. Like, um, you, you know, like any client application, be it a desktop app, a React app, a, an Angular app, you know, none of them are, are secure because the client has access to the code. So anything you would do around that is a server problem. So what I'd say is if you've got, if there is any way of doing that with Web API right now, you wouldn't change it for Blazor, right? That's what. That's actually really what I guess what the answer to the the question is now. Thinking about oh, it, yeah, yeah. Cool. Thanks, Chris. No worries. Uh, what we got? SK, one? Did you have an, a question about inject tokens that you want to just shout out? Ah, uh, he, he might have left actually then. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, I can't speak. Oh, he's on iPad. Um, I mean, just trying to answer that question, can it? I mean, obviously we inject we injected that token provider in the global scope. Obviously, AS, global ASAXs don't exist in, in .NET Core. Um, so, you know, doing anything globally, you do it with a DI container. Um, if that's, I hope that's what you're, I hope that's answering the question. Um, so by putting in 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 the the I container the way we did, that's made it globally available for any component to request an instance of it. Okay, uh, I don't. I think there's any other questions actually outstanding unless i've missed any no, i don't think so any other ones no oh, cool real. um there was one thing somebody did ask i saw in the chat um meet up about testing authenticated and non-authenticated components i don't know if that person's here or not yeah i'm here it's rob ah oh, rob hello um i'll be honest i was this particular uh, solution, um, not that one, this one, uh, I was actually, uh, I only got about 20 minutes before this, this call started in order to try it. So I've actually added a testing library here um, with uh, BUnit, um, and I was just trying to actually get this going. And I didn't get it to work, but I don't think I'm a million miles away. So for anyone who is curious about unit testing Blazor components, BUnit is definitely where you, what you want to be using. Um, and, and it does offer this razor-based uh, component test. So you can uh, literally test your components with the components, which is quite cool. So what I did was I created this auth test component that was wrapped in an authorized view, and it just spits out either an H1 saying authorized or an H1 saying not authorized, depending. And that authorized view needs the, um, that, uh, that provider from that cascading authentication state being passed down to it. So that should kind of, I think Rob, that fits the question you were asking, is that right? Yeah, I'll give that a go. I haven't come across that particular unit test framework. So yeah, I'm so this is how I think you, you'd do it. And I, I'm fairly close, but I, I don't know, it's not quite right at the moment, but essentially you would set up a cascading value like this with the, the auth provider like so. Um, and then um, you put the, the component in between so it, it gets an instance of it um, and then what I've done is I've created this mock auth provider down here um, 
And all I've done is I've overridden that get authentication state async, and I'm just returning an empty claims principle, um, which basically is equivalent to be, being logged out. So I've hard coded being logged out essentially. Um, if I want to be logged in, I'll hard code being logged in. Um, and by changing that mock auth provider, you could then run your test um, to check for not authorized and authorized. Like I said, I didn't quite get it finished, which I was really annoyed by. I was trying to get this done before here to show you. But this is, I think, most of what you're going to need. Um, yeah, I, this I've is got, exactly what I need. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the only bit I probably missed is that this is probably being cascaded down with the wrong name. So basically, if I run this at the moment, um, if that runs through, um, and I need to find out what the internal name is so I can cascade it in the right way, and that might fix it. So if you're, if you're willing to watch me really live, live hack an issue, I might actually be able to get this working right here. Um, so here's our auth test. Um, and down here, it's basically saying that the actual HTML was empty and we were expecting not authorized. So basically nothing's worked there. And I think it's because the name of this is wrong. So if you'll bear with me for a second, let me see if I can very, very quickly get this up and going, if you're willing to, to hang about. Um, so we want to go to the .NET repo because I need to check what this is cascaded as, and this is then the ASP.NET uh, core repo we want to go to. Yeah, if you do need to go, feel free. Sorry, I'm, I really am just like being pedantic about trying to work out this little problem. <laughs> uh, I need that one, I think. Oh, let me just that's spelled wrong if I can't find this really quickly I won't hold you up uh, there we go where is the actual component no that's because I say the authentication state tests where are you No, I can't find the thing I need. Oh, that's rubbish. Let me just quickly double check in here for something. Uh, where are you? Cascading parameter. No, I'll bet it's probably not. I think it's just a typing problem because I'm using a mock provider and I've not probably provided it in the right way to that. But I don't know. Or I could just be slightly, like I say, I hacked this together very, very quickly. So I might just have one tiny little thing that's wrong. But anyway, Rob, basically be unit um, and that will get you what you're after. So it's if you're, it's be unit .com. Um So if you go there, uh, you can go to the documentation and specifically you probably want to check out this bit about cascading values because that's what's really that's what how that um, authentication state is cascaded down so eagle shows you how to do this using c sharp um, and using like traditional unit test style but you can use the razor code version which is all about wrapping it and cascading it down there um, in fact he's even got some stuff about mocking authorization which I didn't even see that because I was running at like a hundred miles an hour earlier. So um, that would probably be useful, but B unit is what you want. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time with that. Appreciate it. No problem. Cool. I think that's everything. So, um, Oh, hold on. One more from Andrew. Uh, did uh, SEO and WebAssembly. Yeah. So SEO and WebAssembly. Uh, okay. So out the box, it's going to suffer from the same problem that every other spa does. It doesn't have pre rendering. Um, but, you can turn on pre-rendering um, and you might actually, uh, again, if you give me a second, I've got a demo of this because I did this last week, actually. Uh, where are you? Pre-rendering demo, pre-rendering, pre-rendering. There we go. So Blazor WebAssembly is a standalone project template. You, you can't do anything about it because it's just static files. Um, so you need a server element to do pre-rendering. Um, so 
what if you're using the hosted template which is what i've been using all the way through you can turn on pre-rendering which is what i've done here so essentially what that involves is you don't use an index.html in the client project anymore you swap to using a host underscore host cshtml razor page in the server um, project you reference blazor webassembly js from there instead but what you do is you use the component tag helper which allows you to do uh, pre-rendering um, the other change you make is in the startup uh, of the server project you fall back to the host page instead of that index.html page that I showed earlier. So if I just quickly spin this up now, um, we can actually see how big a difference this makes. So by default, um, if we go to elements, um, if I open up that, you can see we've got all the stuff. I can go to counter, I can click it all works. But if I go into here and I disable JavaScript, so there's no JavaScript can execute and I refresh, you can see that the site loads up exactly as it did before. If I go to home, that works. Even if I go to fetch data, that even loads with all the data. If I open up app, you can see that we've got all of the HTML included. Um, this is coming down from the server, obviously. We haven't got JavaScript, so Blazor is not running client side here at all. And we've got all of the data available to us. It can all be indexed by uh, a search engine. Okay, but obviously it's not interactive. So if I go to counter and I click the button, nothing happens because we've got no JavaScript. But if I re-enable it, so refresh this time, we get everything as we did before. Now, obviously, you can see there in the in the code. If I just give that a second, you can see when everything became interactive. That big flash of purple. That's the uh, JavaScript side, the Blazor runtime on the on the client kicking in, replacing all of that server rendered code with uh, uh, active components and now everything works as it was before. So you can turn all of that on. The only thing that is a bit fiddly at the moment is you have to kind of jump through some ho hoops to change the uh, text that's in the, the title attribute because there's, there's kind of no built in way to do that particularly easily. Um, again, there's something coming um, from the Blazor team, but I doubt it'll be in .NET 5, it'll probably be in .NET 6. But there are ways around that, you can find like Google that, and there's a few people have done blog posts around that. But that's pre-rendering, and that should help your CEO quite significantly. Hope that helps. Thank you. No worries. Um, cool, I think that's everything. So I'll um, leave you to it, and um, hope this has been useful. Um, if you have any other questions or anything, um, you know, Ping me on on Twitter. Um, it's Chris underscore Sainty. Um, but yeah, other than that, I think that's I think that's hopefully everything addressed. Um, but yeah. Thanks so much for coming, guys. I hope that was helpful.